We're going to get started. This first Torah portion is in Deuteronomy, and it begins in uh, chapter 7, verse 12. It continues to 1125. There is a whole lot here. We're going to try to get through as much as we can, and then we're going to get on to the second uh, portion. So if you join me in the Torah blessing, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bakar Banu Mikohamim Venatan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Atah Adonai Noten HaTorah Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all the peoples and gave to us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. So if you would turn in your Bibles to uh, chapter 7, I'm going to begin in verse 12. And it says, Therefore you shall keep the commandments. Let me see, 7. That's 12. Yep, 12. Then it, then it shall come about because you listened to these judgments and, and kept and keep and to do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you his covenant and his loving kindness, which he swore to your forefathers. He will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain and your new wine and your oil, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock in the land which he swore to your forefathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples, and there will, there will be no male or female barren among you or among your cattle. I like this one. The Lord will remove from you all sickness, and he will not put on you any of the harmful diseases of Egypt, which you have known, but he will lay them on all who hate you. You shall consume all the people whom the Lord your God will deliver to you, your eye shall not pity them, nor shall you serve their gods, for that would be a snare to you. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispo di dispose them? You shall, he says, you shall not be afraid of them. You shall well remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. Now let's uh, sing the blessing after the reading. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lenu Torah imet, vechae olam, natabotekenu, Baruch atah Adonai, noten ha-Torah, amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and planted everlasting life within us, Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. Whew. You know, uh, last Torah study, Pastor Paul uh, did a wonderful job. We, we, we ended up going over time, but that's okay, because when you do two por Torah portions, you, we should have gone way over time. <laughs> if it was up to Pastor Paul, we would have been here until like 7 p.m. <laughs> and Maria. <laughs> but, but he's absolutely right. There's just so much here, so much to go through. Uh, we'll, we'll, go, we'll do as much as we can. Okay, in Roman numeral one, right away, let's do the first fill-in. Uh, Ekev, is that how you would say it? Ekev means... Because or heal in Hebrew. Because or heal. Heal. H E E L. Heal. Heal. Like the I'm sorry. Like the bottom of your heel of your foot. Yeah. Mountain hills. High hills. What a heel. What a heel. I don't know about you, Kathy. <laughs> but I like that. Okay, we will, be, we will be going through two Torah portions today in the book of Deuteronomy. 
Ikev is the Torah portion that begins in Deuteronomy 7.12 and continues to 11.25. The second Torah portion we'll get to is Reheh, and this Torah portion is from Deuteronomy 11.26 to 16.17. So turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 7, uh, verse 12, and we'll get started. Ikev, like, like I said, means because... Uh, this is taken from the first sentence in this parasha. Because you are listening to these rulings, uh, keeping and obeying them, Adonai your God will keep you, the, keep, will, will keep with you the covenant and mercy that he swore to your ancestors. And that's from the complete Jewish Bible. A kev also means, uh, like I said, like heel, the heel of your foot, but it also means Yaakov. Yaakov is taken from the same three letters, okay, of, of, of this. You remember when Yaakov was born, uh, he was holding the heel of who? Esau, yep. Here at the beginning of this parasha, the word Ikev would mean because of or on the hills of keeping God's commandments. Okay, I like this parasha because right away it begins with, with uh, boy, you know, you are going to be blessed. This is what you're going to receive. And, and um, you know, we'll, we'll go on from there. But Moses' farewell address, and that's exactly what this is, everyone. And you already know that. This is a farewell address. Uh, he's speaking to the people. And as we said uh, before in last uh, week or when uh, Pastor Paul was covering Devereen, that, uh, you know, he was, they were going to go in and they were going to uh, uh, fight the, the Mennonites, and then after that he was going to be gathered to his people. Uh, so, you know, I would think that he would have taken four or five years to take care of that, but no. <laughs> no, he rushed right in, but that's how faithful, that's what a righteous man he was. Uh, he went right out and said, come on, you guys, let's get your armies together, get the men together. So, But here, uh, you know, before he's gathered to his people, uh, we read about him being gathered to his people in Deuteronomy, and we also read the same thing in the book of Numbers in uh, Bemidbar. A simple term of gathered to his people would mean that Moses is going to die mm -hmm. in simple terms. Okay. He's already 120. So. He's 120. You know, and that, that that would be amazing. You know, all everybody there uh, was born in the wilderness, or they were 20 years of old at the time. So maybe what the oldest person, other than Moses, would have been about 40. No, no. 30, 38. 40 years plus would have been 20 60 or 19. They would have been so about 30, 60. Oh, because they were there 40 years. That's right. 40 and 20, so 60. So they would have been about 59, 59, 60 years old, the oldest. And then here you've got a man twice as old as that. You know, uh, do you remember when uh, Jacob, remember when Jacob appeared before Pharaoh and they were amazed? Wow, how old are you? You know, <laughs> you know. So go ahead, Sharon. I think you have a mic right there. Yeah. Actually, um, God tells us we are spirit. Mm -hmm. That's our primary form. We are spirit. Mm -hmm. Our body dies, yeah. but our spirit doesn't. Right. So, um, you know, when we talk about death, uh, it, it's just a continuation of our spirit. Um, Amen. And it's, it's, it's just the body that Amen. goes. Yeah. I'm looking through you. <laughs> hey, I remember that song. Yeah. Go ahead, Maria. I've noticed at several places it says, if you keep my laws, my commandments, judgments, and statutes. Now, what are they? Are they all the same, or are they different? Well, you remember at Mount Sinai, all the people wanted to hear were the ten. And then, but, but uh, what Moshe had to do is he had to gather the people together and he had to give them the whole 613. He gave all the commandments to the people. Um, what are the judgments? What are the I think the judgments are part of the, part of the why command. Don't, why don't they just use one 
Uh, because I think it expounds on it. You know, it's like, uh, you know. rhetorical questions you have. Yeah. She knows the answer. <laughs> Do you know the answer, Maria? <laughs> <laughs> You know, but uh, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, help me out there, Sharon. Well, the commandments are for us personally. We need to take hold of them. Yes. Some of the judgments and statutes are for the legal system, which God set up in Israel. And this is how you judge. This is how. This is you know, a life for a life or whatever yeah. it is. And I think that came, that may have come about because of Jethro, when Jethro told uh, Moses, uh, you know, what are you doing? You're over, you're overworking yourself, you know, assign, uh, you know, righteous men to answer the small questions. You know, just recently I was uh, told by a person, you know, did, did you, uh, did you seek God on that? I said, no. I said, what I did is wisdom told me to, to tell you no. You know? <laughs> I said, so, <laughs> I don't, oh my gosh, but no, I didn't seek God on that. But, you know, wisdom said no. <laughs> you know, go ahead, Maria. Yeah. You know, this is something that really should be clarified because in the Adventist church, the biggest thing is that the law was separated into the ceremonial, which we are not obligated to keep, and the moral. And so I would like to know what are the judgments, what are the statutes, what right. are the laws, what are the commandments? Well, you know, later on, I'm going to run into something. I forget where I did it. And I just said, you know what, I'm going to sign this to Maria to look into it. <laughs> so this is going to be... <laughs> Go ahead, Pastor Bruce. Yeah, there's there's four words basically that in the English get all mixed together, and it's the judgments, ordinances, um, commandments, the, the commandments, and the uh, statutes. Statutes, and uh, in English we kind of see them all as the same with slight variations. I think what uh, Sharon just said was really uh, very good. Very good. I, th I think it was actually brilliant. Um, <laughs> Sharon, well, I never, I never if that was heard it put the way you just put it. <laughs> if that uh, was me, Sharon, my head would have been like this. <laughs> and it, it's the legal system from the bottom to the top, and from the top to the bottom. Right. <clears throat> so it's just like in our. In our society, our understanding would be we have city ordinances and, and laws. We have county, state, federal mm -hmm. uh, mandates. mandates, different things. I mean, we just we just went through nine states on our vacation, and and even little things like can you turn right on a red light mm -hmm. is you, you when yeah. you get into a new state you have to you know, watch right. and see what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Because because it's different in each state. Yeah. So these are ordinances and, and county at county and city levels. Uh, <clears throat> so I think that was really uh, well put, the way Sharon put that. It really is the legal system from, from bottom to top and top to bottom. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what we have here too. So they all are different things. And I, don't, I think we get into big danger if we take one whole category and say, well, that's not for us. I don't think we can do that really. I think we have to look at each one and figure out if it applies to us at all, and if it does, how. Mm -hmm. That would be my answer. Yeah. And Yeshua said, good people. I like Sharon's. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm going to say something less brilliant, but... Um, <laughs> we, we know yeah. <laughs> Speaking of what Paul just said, though, I think um, with Maria, it does get a little confusing because in Galatians 5 and again in 6, it talks about circumcision doesn't matter more or less, and that was one of the original commandments. Yeah. And then I was looking for it, but I can't find it. I think it's in 1 Corinthians where it says uh, uh, circumcision doesn't matter, something that. Uh, but following the commandments. Yeah. 
Well, I understand, but it's still, uh, that w you hear what he just said? He said, circumcision doesn't matter, but following the commandments is what's important. Well, wait a minute, I thought circumcision was Was part of the commandments, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so there's definitely, um, um, there's a bit of confusion on what applies. Right. No, you're today. absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And it's, it's uh, odd how Kathleen shared at Shabbat how uh, she's driving around with a historian. Yeah. And she's getting the full account of everything. Mm -hmm. And Peggy leans over and says, now I know how, I know exactly what, uh, how Kathleen feels. <laughs> <laughs> she asked me yet last night, uh, how many miles, how many miles would it be from uh, Iran up to the Ukraine? And I said, you know, I said, it would probably be approximately, I said, I'm just going to guess about 400, 420 miles. It'd be like us driving up to San Francisco. How would you know that? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I've taken geography in, in school, and you know, I, there's some things you remember. You know, so so I know <laughs> I'm the same way. You know, but but okay. But let's let's go on. Okay, and I was talking about gathered to his people. Uh, but, you know, in the Torah, in the first five books of the Bible, Moses' meaning goes much deeper than he just died or he's going to die. Abraham, Jacob, Aaron, they were gathered to their people or to his people. And that's only to name a few. There's, there's more. What is the deeper meaning? I'm going to assign this to Maria to do the study on it. So, you know, <laughs> that was where I was. <laughs> no, my understanding is the Lord is speaking to Moses about a special place. You know, the gather to his people doesn't just mean he's going to die. At least I don't take it as that. A place where all righteous and obedient uh, people are going to go and, 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 you know, God's going to be there and they're going to be with, with, their, with the Lord. Uh, today we would say that what Moses is talking about is heaven. You know, and you know when I when gathered to his people, uh, that is my 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 take on it. I think it's much deeper than just uh, he died. You know, go ahead, Sharon. Um, well, isn't it kind of like didn't they call it Abraham's bosom before yep. Yeshua died? Yeah. 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 And that's exactly it, you know. And then when Yeshua went and set the captives free, and isn't it? Uh, I mean, I'm not gonna say it's ironic or you know, but it's you know, it's Abraham's bosom. It's not Moses's bosom, yeah. you know. So it's uh, you know, all these promises when they're talking about uh, get, you know your forefathers, it all begins with Abraham, you know. But then again, uh, there were righteous men before Abraham. So, but Moses' farewell address continues. So uh, in Deuteronomy uh, 2.7, it says, For the Lord your God has blessed you in all that you have done. He has known your wandering through the great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have not lacked anything. <clears throat> so here in this parish, Moses is telling the Israelites that because they listened, and they kept and did God's commandments. Uh, they have a bright future. And that's uh, letter A in your fill-in. The future looks bright for God's people. So, uh, <clears throat> so things are looking good. You know, in this, in this Torah portion, things are looking good for the, the Israelites. The promised land that they are about to enter really is promising. Uh, God said it, and he's going to do it. So in the wilderness, the people uh, needed food, and what did God do? He supplied it. Uh, the people needed water, and the Lord gave them water. The only work that the Israelites had to do was to get up and go out and get it. So uh, go ahead, Maria. Was God really glad that they went to the promised land? Because he promised it to 12 tribes. 12 tribes did not go in. 
And it was the tribe yeah. stayed out. Well, and it wasn't. I really think that uh, Moses should have put his foot down, because what what we do read is, especially uh, in the in the midrash, is uh, once they went in and conquered Canaan, once they drove out all the the nations, the idol worshippers that were there that Reuben, Gad, Reuben and Gad realized just how uh, great this land was. It was much better, even though they were in, uh, on the east side of the Jordan and they had plenty of land there for their animals, uh, they realized that had they gone in, they would have had much more land, that it would have been. Uh, so, uh, but Moses, you know, he said, well, go ahead. Moses was going to go to war with them until they said, well, we'll help you fight when you go in. But he compromised. He and the other tribes were ready to go to war with the... With the no, they weren't going to... Yeah. I don't think they were... They said. weren't going to go... Well, no, I don't wanted, think they were going to... They didn't want to go to war. war. The, Moses told them that what are you doing? You're acting like your forefathers, uh, not going into the promised land. So he basically said, if you want to stay over here, you can, but you've got to go help your brothers later. Right. Uh, when they said they were going to stay, Moses and the other tribes, according to histories, they were going to go to war. And then Reuben said, no, what we'll do is we'll stay here, but when you're ready to go to war, we will join you. And then the other tribe said, oh, okay, well, that's they were, fine. No, they were allowed to build their houses and get every, in the, in the cities. And then after that, uh, when they did that, then they came and they joined the rest of the tribes to conquer Canaan. But like what, but what I'm saying is, from the get-go, he should have he should have put his foot down and said, "No, you know this is the promised land. This is what the Lord promised us. Let's go." But even beforehand, when you when you read about the blessings that Jacob gave uh, uh, Gad and Reuben, you see just what type of uh, people they were. And unstable. Yeah. Go ahead, Pastor Paul. Yeah. Well, the people were people. Yeah, people were people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the bottom line of it. Yeah. But but the thing about crossing over into the land we have to realize is that before they went into the land while they were under judgment, God did take care of everything they needed. As soon as they were crossing over, however, yep. it became their responsibility to do his commandments and do what he said. Because it says right here, it says, Because you listen. <clears throat> right. And that's Shema actually. Right. You not only listen, but you do. Yeah. And if you do that, well, it's a it's a verb. You'll yeah. be taken care of. And and see, the thing is, they never really did conquer the whole land. No. Yeah. Yeah. They never did. The closest they ever came was under David. Right. And in this case, sorry, yeah. did not happen. Yeah. And they and that and they should have. They should have conquered the land. All of them should have entered the land, but. Uh, as Pastor Paul said, they were acting like people. You know, how how dare they act like people? But they did. <laughs> no, every so you know, and he did supply for them. We know that every morning manna was there on the ground for them, and there was enough water for everyone, including the livestock. And this was when they were in the wilderness. For forty years, God supplied for His people. Now that they are ready to enter the promised land, let's take a look at what the Lord is now promising them. And uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7, verse 13, <clears throat> I'll start right there. It says, And he will love you, bless you, and make you numerous. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain, your new wine, your oil, the newborn of your cattle, and the offspring of your flock in the land which he swore to your forefathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There will be no sterile male or infertile uh, female among you or among your cattle. And the Lord will remove from you all sickness 
and he, he will not inflict upon you any of the harmful diseases of Egypt, which you have known, but he will give them to all who hate you. Okay, God is promising them prosperity and wealth. And that's in number one. Moses promises that for fulfilling the commandments, the Israelites will prosper in the promised land. So promises and prosper are the two fill-ins. Let's go ahead and do number two. All Israel will be healthy. No sickness in the land. God is promising them prosperity and wealth. They're, they will not get sick. So no plagues, no COVID-19. <laughs> no. <laughs> you think we might have a problem there? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm wondering if a lot of these diseases that are happening now, that they're cycling themselves. You know, if... Uh, this COVID-19 may have been something else, a plague or whatever, back in the time of Egypt. Everything and it, sick it's sick. Yeah, exactly. It's just coming about again. I don't know if you've heard the, the, new, the new report now that, uh, that uh, people are getting sick again. They're coming down with COVID. And these are all people who have already had the COVID vaccination. You know, so... so uh, you know, they're, they're all, so there's going to be something else that's going to come from it. They heard it was all the people that weren't vaccinated that were getting it. Well, at first, that's what they were saying. It's, the only people that are getting sick are people that are not vaccinated. I think that's what they want you to believe. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. now it's our fault. What was that? 40% of hospitalizations in Great Britain right now are vaccinated people. Oh, wow. Are vaccinated people. Yeah. The hospital. Yeah. Being yeah. So. No, you know, and, th and that's unfortunate. I think we we talked about this a couple. Of, you, you get the microphone. Give the microphone to David. Oh, right. Then let's do that right now. Let's do that right now, David. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's get it now. We're going to stop right now. We're going to pray for a brother. Uh, so if everybody can uh, in agree, his sinuses. His sinuses. Yeah, his sinuses. It's hard for him to breathe. So, thank you, Father. Yes. Father, we thank you, Lord, for David, Lord. And Father, that, that he came up here, Lord, and that, he, that we are, he's going to receive this prayer, this healing, Father. Father, come down on him now, Lord. Heal him and heal him completely. That his sinuses would be cleared up, Father. That he would be able to take a deep breath and breathe in deeply, Lord, and breathe out again. That he would walk and not get tired, Father. That, Father, that everything that he, that he does, Lord, his sinuses would not be an issue, Lord. We lift David up to you, Lord. That you would heal him. You would heal him completely right now, Lord. In Yeshua's name. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. 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 Right. Amen. Now, David's not the only one here with sinuses. Okay. So, um, we all have yeah. yeah. Well, I know. <laughs> sinus problems. Yeah. And so we need to apply that to all the other people that are here as well. Amen. Yes. Amen. As a Amen. Amen. I get right on that, Maria. Right? <laughs> 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 we need the board. <laughs> Okay, let me see where I left off. Let's <laughs> Every baby born would be a healthy child. The Lord will also bless the ground they stand on, and they would have an abundance of crops. Uh, wouldn't you all sign up for that? I, remember all this. If, if Then he said, remember all this if you would only keep God's commandments. We're already all signed up. <laughs> The Lord will also give them victory when they drive out their enemies from the land. The people are reminded how God led them out of Egypt. If God could destroy the great and powerful Pharaoh, you know, how much, uh, how much effort is it going to take them to defeat those in, those in Canaan? You know, in fact, you know the people were supposed to go to battle 
And um, it was God that was going to go before them and defeat them. You know, it's, it, it's, I, I think about the Battle of Armageddon. You know, yeah, we're going to all be gathered. We're going to go. But it's going to be Yeshua that's going to defeat every single person that comes up against, against the Lord's people. Uh, Pastor Bruce? You know, it's, it's interesting, but we, there's uh, several uh, <clears throat> kind of crossovers and meanings here. But obviously, in the land is, is really supposed to be a picture of heaven. I mean, when you read this, this would be unique to only that nation, and that is, would be a picture of heaven. No sickness, no, right. uh, you know, uh, poverty. no poverty, yeah. no, none of it. And, and uh, but the problem is Israel never attained to that. Yeah, yeah. And even, you know, I was, I was, uh, no male or female will be barren. Well, Many of the matriarchs were barren. Yeah, that's right. Which is a very interesting concept until they were healed. God, God had closed the womb. Then we had a picture. We were talking earlier about the idea of, uh, well, Maria brought up the idea of why did some nations stay across the, on the far side of the river. You know, that was the same thing that Lot did when he was given the choice of what land to choose. He took the very best at the first. Right. And of course, here's the nation of Israel coming up to the promised land. They see the bet, they see this great land, and so the flesh, I think, gets involved, and these tribes decide, man, I want this for myself. Right. I don't even right. need to see the rest of it. This is good land, and yeah. we're taking it. Right. So we, now we have sin, and then we have this this picture we were talking earlier about, uh, Sharon brought up the idea of, of, you know, when we die, it's just our body that drops off. Well, you know, the sin that came through the serpent, I was just thinking about that if she said that, that the serpent, snakes shed their skin. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that is in part a result of the fall. Mm. Just, I, you know, it was just yeah. a thought, I'm not espousing anything. Yeah. Just a thought that now we've taken on some of those qualities of the serpent. Mm -hmm. Right. Because uh, you shed his skin? Yeah, well, the you shedding shed of skin, we shed our skin when we die. Right. So I'm, I'm not throwing anything out that this is dogma or, you know, new revelation. I'm just, it's just a thought that I was, I was turning around. So I thought I'd just throw that out because there's a lot of parallels here. Right. Because this is supposed to be heaven. And even in heaven now, the heaven is contaminated because Satan is there. Yeah, yeah. He stands before the Father bringing accusations. So even it's polluted, that's why there has to be a new heaven. Trees for healing, even then. Yeah, yeah. trees for healing, even then, in heaven. So uh, you can just see how this whole thing has been perversely yeah. uh, tainted. Yeah. It's just quickly, it's a little different, but what you were sharing about how they saw the land and they said this is good enough and it made me think of the Messianic versus the Christian church uh, where they, where we say the old wine is good enough, right? right? And I've always seen those two and a half tribes as the church that has not really crossed over mm -hmm. into the roots of their faith. Right. Yeah. So it's good enough, they're saved, they're content, they're happy, but it's not the fullness they haven't crossed over. Right. You know, and I also, I also equate all this to uh, the Jews not returning to home, not returning home, even in the, you know, the, the, the 20th century or, you know, uh, they, yeah, even today, yeah. They, many of them, you know, they're told to come back home and, and uh, they won't do it. You know, and here you have the two and a half tribes, and really it's it's two tribes because Manasseh got thrown in. Here we want you with them because yeah. you know. So, but unfortunately, uh, kind of a guard dog. yeah, and and then when they were taken into Babylon, well, who they come or uh, you know who they conquer first? The tribes on the east side, you know. So, go ahead, Maria. Uh, Spiritually, you're saying that when they say this land, it's heaven, 
literally is then uh, this land Israel. So when I read this, it says, if you go into the land, if you go into Israel. Yeah. The rabbis will tell you that. It's They're a type and shadow. Huh? It's a metaphor. Yeah, it's yeah. a metaphor. It's okay. a type and shadow. Then right. what do us little Gentiles do? We're if grafted this is in. A heaven, We're grafted in. And this is yes. Israel. Right. 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 Am I left outside with uh, Manasseh yeah, and Reuben? Yeah. <laughs> the red-headed stepchild? <laughs> it's just a metaphor, so you can right. take it literally in that sense, but it's a type and shadow. Right. But you're right. grafted in. Yeah. But you're grafted in, so no, you're, you're good to go. But Amen. if I take it literally? Don't get ulcers over this, Maria. <laughs> if, if, you take, if you take a metaphor, let me, you know, Maria's in a mood Oh, yeah. Mood, but Welcome back, of, Maria. If, if, we, if we try to take a metaphor literally, we end up with problems. We, in, in understanding, in discerning, uh, and th this is how we get uh, replacement theology. This is how we get yeah. replacement theology. Yeah, yeah. Is we're taking yeah. A, is a metaphor and taking it literally. Well, we're they came to the border. We're trying to tear down the fence. Yeah, but what I'm saying is it was supposed to be like heaven. Right. But it never attained to that. Yeah. Right from the get go, be, for one thing, they never got rid of the enemy out of. Yeah. They, you know, they never conquered the land completely. After the fall, it wasn't like heaven. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Ever since the fall, Eden was. Well, look how perfect yeah. it would. It was. It was right after uh, he destroyed the earth, and you had Noah and the, Noah and the and his, the rest of his family. That would have seemed like, boy, perfect. We're going to get started on the right foot. We're full speed ahead. We're going to be great. Referee. Referee. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, two, two weeks later. Two weeks later. later. <laughs> then he got drunk. Then he got drunk, yeah. Who was, I don't know who was first. Pastor Paul? No. No. Bill, Bill says no. No, I said no. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Just weighing in on that heaven, because we don't have a whole lot of information about heaven, really. Right. But we do know a few things. We know that heaven is divided into different categories. Mm -hmm. Nobody except those that are filled with the light, with the spirit, et cetera, et cetera, can go into the new Jerusalem. Which means there are people that are not able to go into the new Jerusalem, which indicates that the nations will still be there in some capacity. Right. And that's the reason, if you follow this analogy, if you will, or metaphor through, you realize, okay, why do we have the trees that have the 12 fruits and all the leaves for healing if right. God's people are not going to be afflicted by healing? But yet we have the tree and the leaves and we have people that aren't allowed to go into the New Jerusalem. So we know there's a separation of some sort. What it is, you tell me. <laughs> Sharon, Sharon first. Maria, you want to hand her your mic? Yeah, give it to Sharon first. Though, I Sharon. Sharon. Oh, go ahead, Gary. Let me really crack the eggs and make some scrambled stuff. I want novel right back in. Do we ever go to heaven? My contention would be no. Because it says we're appointed once to die and after that the resurrection. The common tradition is when people die, they go to heaven. However, how can you go to heaven and receive a reward without the prior judgment? Yeah. And yeah. I don't read anywhere in scripture where we go to heaven. I remember there's a tribulation. There is a resurrection. There is a second resurrection, which I don't want to be a part of. The first one, yes. And there's the millennium. We are on earth this entire time. 
And is it not heaven and Jerusalem that comes to earth? Yeah. But that's a thousand year reign. Yeah, so and the then, point is, yeah. I mean, we all think about we die, we go up to heaven, but yeah. I don't yeah. see anywhere in scripture. I mean, I was taught that in college, but I don't see anywhere in scripture where it says that. Yeah. Yeah. Where that they say that people die and you go to hell. You're gonna get a lot of that tombstone, you go to hell stuff. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point is how can a person be sent to hell without judgment? No. That's all in Torah. You have to have judgment before punishment yeah. or reward. And that doesn't occur, one, at the beginning of the millennium, the second one at the end of the millennium. So how can a person experience either reward or punishment prior to the judgment? Right. And all right. throughout the Old Testament, it always talks about I mean, Sheol is like the grave, and there's all this consistent, you know, documentation right. of sleeping with the fathers, waiting for the resurrection, the stuff yeah. in the Psalms about yeah. waiting for this all to be over and yeah. being resurrected to yeah. The and that's why that's why the Jewish un that's why the Jewish understanding is sleeping until he comes so back for his people. The eggs? Yes, you yeah. did. Okay. It depends what he's going to say. <laughs> I just, um, just speaking to what uh, Gary said, it does say in the end of chapter twenty, after the great white, uh, well, there's a great white throne judgment after the thousand year reign. Right. I understand it. In verse fourteen and twenty, it says, "Then death and Hades, which is the equivalent of Sheol, were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, or uh, the lake of fire is Gehenna." And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Uh, and then he goes into the holy city and right. river. And, and I yeah. think everybody's required to come into the city once a year, remember? Right. Or God right. won't send rain on their land. That's right. But we need to have Patrick here to explain this fully. But basically... Um, I don't have any problem that Moses is dead as a doornail right now, no. but he appeared. On, but he appeared uh, with uh, the Lord, who seemed yeah. to not really care about Peter. You know, Peter yeah. was trying to talk to him, and God just totally ignored him. Right. You know, we'd think that God'd be really excited to see us. You know, so they're yeah. kind of in another um, dimension. So here's yeah. Moses interacting with Yeshua on the Mount of Transfiguration, but he's still on the ground dead because there's only, as Gary said, one resurrection that counts. Yeah. And it's still coming up. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like the first one of that resurrection. It's kind of like that scrambled eggs that we had uh, uh, months ago uh, when we were discussing uh, the sacrifices. You know, Yeshua, the one, the one important and only sacrifice, sacrifice for all. But yet, you have prophets in the Word that talk about sacrifices during the millennial reign. So it's like. Like you said, uh, there's some things there that, uh, you know, we... Uh, Patrick's not available today. Go ahead, Sharon. Let Sharon go first. Well, I think, you know, we as humans really like to put things in boxes. Yeah. Okay, this is the literal meaning. This is the spiritual, and the two will never meet. But what are we? Primarily, what are we? Spirit, all right? We happen to have this flesh and blood encompass us or we're Wrap, in that tent. Wrapped around our spirit. Um, and I think there is spiritual in every... When we see something in scripture, yes, um, it's both. It's a dichotomy. It's, it's factual, um, and, um, but it's also spiritual. And I think the deeper I go... It's the spiritual that God wants us to get a hold of. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's more than belief. Huh? It's spiritual floating around. Well, I, I don't think you understand what I'm saying, actually. Yeah, they're all spinning right now. Yeah. Um, now I can... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I know what you're saying, and you're, and you're saying it very well. We don't have a spirit. We are spirit, spirit. is what the scripture says. We are spirit. We, are spirit. Yeah. Yeah. we have a... You were a rabbi spirit. 
It's pure wrapped in flesh. Exactly, exactly. And I think every every what? truth in that scripture works. Yeah. We need to come at it with both sides, okay, when it says... Oh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, um, whatever the commandment yeah. is, honor thy father and thy mother. Yeah. Okay, we try to do that in the physical, in the here and now. Amen. Um, but there's a strip spiritual side yeah. that is so important. Yeah. And it's um, God's trying to teach us far deeper than... We can see. You know, and you're absolutely right. And using honor your 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 mother and your father is a is a good example because you know that even if your parents have passed on, you are not supposed to speak uh, bad of them. You are still still required to honor them. Pastor Bruce is next. Okay. Am I up? Yeah. I was just going to say that the whole idea of heaven is one of those, I'm not going to call it a metaphor because I believe it's a real yeah. place, obviously. Yes. But the Bible does not address heaven very much and the, and the details are scant. Right. Yeah. Uh, the Bible spends most of its time talking about the here and now and the millennial reign. And the problem that we have is in our society, in our belief system called Christianity, we put all the focus on this scant concept called heaven. Right. And we don't understand one thing about it, and yet it's the primary foundation for our faith. Right. And if you don't think that's going to cause problems, you need to think again. Because we're getting the cart before the horse. And we wonder why it's not working right. Yeah, but you know, it's easier to comfort people when you speak of heaven. You know, uh, like the way we're speaking of it. So yeah. go ahead, Pastor Paul. All right. Well, the only thing I'd say about this, as far as heaven goes, I know all that I need to know about heaven. Honestly. Yeah. What I don't know is what I'm supposed to be doing here to make absolutely sure I get there. Yeah. Now, I'm learning that. That's what working out your salvation with fear and trembling is all right. about. But the idea of where we are in the cosmos of being in the presence of God in any way, shape, or form, we have to remember everything we know right here that we can physically identify has time and space, period. As soon as you cross into the other dimension, there is no time and there is no space. All bets are off. So when yeah. you go to the other side, you may be dead here, but when you're on that side, you could be 2,000 years down the road yeah. from where we are. Yep. Yep. And absolutely walking, seeing everybody you ever do, walking in divine health and all of that. Yeah. What we, unless you've been there, you really don't get it. And I mean, we know we have lots of people saying they've been there, they've seen this, they've done this. And you know, the medical profession for years have gone, well, lack of oxygen and they didn't understand and blah, blah, blah. Well, possibly, but there's just too many people that we start to know personally right. that have been there, have come back, and you know, they're not crazy people. Yeah, And so they experienced something that was real for them, and they're trying to tell us, listen, don't be afraid of dying. It's not, yeah, your flesh, whatever amounts to that, may be right there in the hole, and it needs to be resurrected, but your spirit is not in that hole. Right. right. Gary, go ahead and put this egg back together. <laughs> I don't think that's possible. What? I think what Bruce has said needs more of a point. All this stuff about heaven, we're going to go to heaven, goes along with the traditions of men, basic Christianity. Get your e-ticket to heaven and then do what you want, party all you want, sin all you want. You know, we're saved by grace. The Jews are out. We are in, blah, blah, blah. And it's a bunch of crap. Right. You know? The point is, we have Torah, which are our instructions. Yes. We are to express our faith by our works. Yep. And following the Torah, God wants us to be obedient in the pursuit of being righteous. Mm -hmm. 
the emphasis is not on what's going to be in heaven and how we get there and all this other kind of stuff. The point is living in the here and now, being Torah observant, following the instructions, right. being obedient. And then beyond that, we have two tasks. One is to go and preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. The second is to make disciples. This is a 24-7 commission. Amen. It's not a couple hours on the weekend and do whatever I want the rest of the time. You know, the compromises, this, that, and whatever, which so many people look at it that way. Right. Christ said, take up your cross, deny yourself. It's a 24-7 proposition. What are we, what is our real purpose here? Okay, we're playing in the world. Some people reluctantly come out of Egypt, but they refuse to let the Egypt get out of them. Right. Because the world is too much fun, it's too much exciting, but it's all temporal. The stuff with people dying and experiencing all these things. Yep. Hasatan can duplicate all that stuff and make all that sort of stuff happen. Or just take some good drugs and you can get some really good stuff. <laughs> you know, the, the point is, like what Paul was saying, when this flesh dies, that spirit returns. Right. That, that comes to God. Right. And the whole point of the resurrection is, the whole hope is, like when you wake up in the morning after a nice long sleep, you know, that the time, okay, you died, boom, <laughs> resurrection is 2,000 or every year in the future. Right. Or for some of these guys, it's going to be four and 5,000 years. Yep. You know, the focus is, Living here and now in an obedient, yeah. committed life. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, you know, all we know is we're going to enjoy it when we go be with the Lord. Don't know what it's going to be like, but we're going to enjoy it. We're going to go to uh, Sharon, and then we're going to move on. Well, you had something to say? Okay. Um, I had a very interesting conversation with Susan Contreras yesterday. I'm just sharing this. Because, oh, she shared it with a bunch of us, so I think okay. it's okay to share. Um, and it was a number of days before Reuben left his body and passed on. Um, and she said it was, it was a weird experience. She said, he kept telling me, cut the cord, cut the cord. Yeah. She had no idea what the cord is, which I, I was surprised at. Um, but it's it's like when we go into the uh, when a baby is born, the umbilical cord has to be cut, mm -hmm. and Proverbs talks about a silver cord that that is a part of the spirit to the body, and um, I guess she had never read that or anything. She had no idea what Reuben was talking about. He said you have to cut the cord, so she went and found a cord and a pair of scissors, um, you know, and she cut it. And um, he didn't say anything after that. But um, I tried to tell her, well, that's in scripture. Yeah. That's, that's how you have to release the release spirit. Release them, right. You cut the cord. So the right. spiritual and, and what the, um, the word says as factual yeah. are really one and the same. Amen. Amen. So. And you're exactly right, Sharon, because I know as a pastor, when we go in and we pray for... Uh, a person in the in the hospital or, or at the home, you know, first thing we do is uh, we'll ask, you know, are you, are you believing in a miracle? Or are you ready to release? Are you ready to let them go? To cut the cord? Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, the you know, the one gentleman that was here earlier, um, he said he he was ready. He said first he we prayed for a miracle, but then he called and said, "No, I'm ready." To to let her go. I said, okay. And then we prayed that way. You know. We did that I, with Sheila I, and she died. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So everybody in the family just got together and we all released her. Released her, yeah. yeah. I hate to follow Sharon and follow that, but I was just thinking that one of the uh, things that proves that the spirit doesn't change, um, this is kind of, well, I almost passed, but I, when I got out of AAT training, I came home. I was in you know, the best shape of my life, and my brothers were there, and we were kidding around and made some bet about this tree branch. And I ran 10 foot up this tree, just whoosh, 
grabbed this branch, did a backflip. My brothers were both sitting there like I was Superman or something, you know? <laughs> and I'm not a world-class athlete or anything. Okay, well, in my mind today, 50 years later, if you bet me 20 bucks, I can see myself do that. Right. So what do you think my chances of success are? Oh, yeah. Are? <laughs> you know, my brain has, I mean, not my brain, but... I got but, 50 bucks. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that thing that, whatever it is that is, yeah. <laughs> that thing that, I'd probably break my, you know, break my uh, neck, go up three feet and fall. But that thing that's really us yeah. really hasn't changed. Yeah. And, and, I, and today, I have to be careful. I watch every step when I go down the stairs because I said, Bill, you can't afford to break your ankle because yeah. you're self-employed. Okay. But in my mind, I still think I can run up that tree and do a backflip off a branch. Well, tell me about it. I went to a, uh, a reunion one year, and uh, you know, maybe it was like 10 years ago or something. But uh, one of the guys came up to me and said, hey, Vince, can you still dunk a basketball? I said, that was like uh, 50 pounds ago and, <laughs> and, and 30 years. I said, so no. <laughs> Yeah, in my mind, I still can, but but let's move on, everyone. For 40 years, God was disciplining the Israelites as they wandered in the desert. You know, we got to move on because there's going to be some other things in here that are going to be controversial. So. In chapter 8, God shows that he is a God of love. In verse, a verse uh, Moses, Moses says, just as fa the father disciplines his child, so God disciplines you. In uh, chapter 8, 7, 9, Moses describes how wonderful the land is. He says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of streams of water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valley and the hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines, fig trees, pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food without shortage, in which you will not lack anything, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills can dig, you can dig copper. You know, we've been to Israel, and it's amazing. There's a lot of places where, uh, you know, you go down into the valleys, and yeah, you know, even here you go down to the valley, you probably dig down, and you'll, you'll run into some water. You know, but there's not many places where you can go up into the mountains and do some digging, and then you have springs of water. Well, that's not that's the case in Israel. In Israel, you've got water, uh, you know, everywhere in the hills. You know, so it's a it is a land that is that is that is flowing with uh, milk and honey. It is a good land. So let's uh, fill in a couple more. And letter B, forty years of preparation. They have gone through the now, you know, I, you know, you can get technical about it and say, no, it's only 38 or 38 and a half, but 40 years of preparation. And number one, God will continue to provide for his children. As we read here, he's still going to, uh, to provide for them. But in, in number two, no more manna, but enough food that w no one will go hungry. And we'll stop there. So the B, the fill-in was preparation. One, the fill-in is provide. And in two, manna and food. <clears throat> so before we go to some hands, uh, all this, if we would keep, if they would keep their eyes on the Lord. You know, at least eight times I, I counted right away. There may be more, but... At least eight times I counted that the people will be, be blessed if they keep God's commandments. It keeps coming out. If you keep his, uh, my commandment. Not only will there be an abundance of water in the land, but the Lord will supply food to eat. Okay, right here Moses describes the seven uh, species of, of, of the land. And uh, the seven species were the main food supply of Israel. The farmers of that time were required to bring a first fruit offering to the temple from one of these seven species. I was just wondering, this is, you know, when, you, when you're doing a study and there's things that just, you just think about. But I was just wondering, you know, while I was doing this Torah study, if the seven species are items that are represented in the manna. 
you know, that the Lord gave the people, you know, daily in the wilderness, you know, and, and that's why I thought it's interesting how they could gather it up, they could cook it, and it would just cook right up and everything. So did it have some oil in it, some olive oil, or did it, you know, all the all these different ingredients? Uh, you know, because when they entered the land, the manna stopped, and now the people, you know, they had to prepare their own food. But instead of this manna, I was wondering, that had all these in ingredients in it, well, now they had to go out and get each one in order to bake whatever they wanted to bake. That's just uh, just thought. So go ahead, Gary. During this time, correct me if I'm wrong, but especially on the east side of the Jordan, I guess it would be Transjordan now, did not many of the Nephilim tribes end up being destroyed yes. ahead of Israel? both on the east as well as on, well, the Canaanites would be on the west side, but many of them were completely, utterly destroyed before Israel ever did enter into the promised land. All, all no. no. No, I mean, most of them. Most, yeah. There were 15 giant tribes in the land when they entered. Didn't they, I mean, one or two, I think in the far north, one or two they still had to deal with. Well, right. then, then look at even David. He dealt with uh, Goliath, you know. Yeah, they never got rid of all the giants. There were 15 tribes listed, of giant tribes, and uh, they didn't get rid of all of them. Right. And then one um, thing, yeah, and even in, in war, one thing you have to understand in war, and even to this day, Israel is uh, very... Uh, I don't want to say generous and I mean we read where it says do not have pity on them <clears throat> but Israel you know if uh, they're going to give you a way out if, if, if you will take it and even at this time the, the, the in the Midrash it says they all, always uh, cornered the people in three different areas they always left the fourth area open for them to leave now if they didn't want to leave then they would surround them and they would go to battle. So uh, that's why um, I remember us reading, I don't, I don't think it was in Genesis. So Sun Tzu said that, you know, in the, along with a lot of this. One with a lot of things that Sun Tzu, the <coughs> art of war, in battle, you always attack with overwhelming odds, but he always said to leave and exit for the enemy because if they realize they have to fight to the death, they'll fight much harder. But right. if you leave them in exit, yeah. when they realize they're overwhelmed, they're going to take that exit and leave. Right. right. So that's right. a tenet of sons too. Okay. So, uh, you know, with, with that, what I'm getting at is even to this day, you know, uh, they had, they're being bombarded, you know, from uh, Hamas or, you know, and uh, instead of just going in and completely destroying them, you know, it seems like Hamas will drop all their bombs on them and then all of a sudden okay time out we want a peace treaty you know until we they can build up their allotment again so go ahead pastor paul uh, in that regard you know i mean israel is struggling with these enemies and even if they take one out they got five others to replace them or however it works out but we if we stop and go back and realize that god said to the first group I will drive them out yes. before them. Yes. But when they didn't go in, yeah. then the second group that went in, they had to do the driving out. Yeah. Now, I mean, God said, I'll be with you, but they went from city to town to village to tribe, yeah. and they had to do it. Yeah. And God stood with them. Yeah. But before that, he said he would do it. And see, that's a whole different matter. And, and that, I say that for us the same way. You know, if, if we don't operate in faith and trust in God, I mean, right from the get-go, doing what he says, we can end up with lots of things going on in our life that I think we could avoid entirely. Right. But yep. because we don't go there, then we get to face one thing after another thing. And we can get victory, but it's like, man, we're we're working this warfare, yeah. driving this stuff out. 
you know, let God do it. You know, he does he's, it much better. Yeah, he does it much better. He doesn't need our help. Just let him do it. You know, and uh, I agree with you. And, and uh, you know, when we talk about where we read that you are a stiff-necked pe people, you know, it's no different than t today. We are too, you know, so. But uh, move on, you guys. What are the seven species? You're rushing, Mr. Brenda. I have to. <laughs> we're, not even, we're not even on the second uh, parashah yet. <laughs> what are the seven species? They are wheat. This harvest covered the northern Negev as well as other areas of Canaan. It would always ripen about early Savan, okay, uh, right before summer. In the time of the festival of Shavuot, okay. The next is barley. When you think of barley, what do you think of? Animal beer. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you think of beer. Well, back in ancient times, barley was used to make bread. The barley sheaves were brought to the temple and waved on the second day of unleavened bread. Okay, today much of the barley crop in Israel is used for making beer. beer. <laughs> okay, and then there is grapes. Vineyards are abundant in Israel today just as it was in ancient, ancient times. Remember when the spies returned from spying out the land and that cluster of grapes that they brought out? Mm -hmm. You know, the grapes were the size of like apples. They were, they were, they were big, okay? Uh, Artists. <laughs> you think that was just a... I think they were multiple grapes. I mean, oh, where do you think? We have, we have good sized grapes today, but yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, but... <laughs> well, let me ask you this. If I don't they doubt. were then available, why are they not available today? Well, it's just like, you know, he says, if you obey my commandments. If you don't obey my commandments, he will not bless you. I think a lot of that land is not being blessed the way it should be blessed because of the way the people are in the land. You know, look at, uh, what do they say about... Uh, What's the city there on the coast where the airport's at? Uh, Tel Aviv. They say Tel Aviv is probably just as bad as West Hollywood and San Francisco. In fact, even worse. It's the gay capital. Yeah, gay capital. You know, that's, that's, now how is the Lord going to bless that land? What's going to happen is when his judgment comes, now we know why it says judgment starts in the house of the Lord. You know, clean up your act, you know. And until they do that, their grapes are going to be the size of the grapes that we buy at Stater Brothers, you know. So, <laughs> uh, Pastor Bruce? I think in answer to, to that in part, we have to remember that the land of Canaan was occupied by giants. Yeah. And the giants were the, the Nephilim. They were the the progeny of the fallen angels and the fallen angels the watchers brought the secret arch to the earth yeah uh, this is lined out in the book of Enoch and, and Jasher and, and so on and so forth so they they had giant grapes and, and giant fruits because of GMO and, and all of these kinds of things going on and the genetic engineering that, in my opinion, is the spirit of the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. And I believe that when Yeshua said it's going to be just like in the days of Noah, that's what we're dealing with today is that spirit of the Nephilim. Yeah. I believe the Nephilim yeah. is still here. That's good. People yeah. say, well, why aren't they giants? Because when you're dealing with genetic engineering, you can have pygmies. Yeah. You can have whatever you des des decide to create. And, and giants are just too obvious. Right. So the enemy, the best rule of thumb, is you blend in with your enemy, and when you can't be spotted, right. you can blend and, and wreak havoc on the whole society. I believe we're dealing with that spirit very much today, the spirit of the Nephilim. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, that, that's interesting. How does it happen? Yeah. How does it happen? Is it not a worldwide flood? Well, that, you know, that gets into a whole new things, you know, whether, 
whether it was worldwide or not, or in Jewish tradition, of course, Og may have gotten onto the hung, ark. Hung on to uh, the ark. I mean, I, there's so many explanations. Who knows? Maybe right. fallen angels came again. I don't know. I don't think anybody has the answer to that. But I do believe, you know, eating and drinking and marrying are not wrong or sinful things in and of themselves. So when the Lord says, this is what you're going to have in the last days, what's he talking about? Yeah. Right. That's an awful he's yeah. not talking about getting, he's talking about uh, you don't get unequally yoked. That has nothing to do with a Jew marrying a non-believer. Jews were always allowed to marry non-believers. Mm. Always. They, except the Levites, they were being told, don't get unequally yoked with a non-human entity. Oh. And that is still an issue today. Oh, yeah. And we see it even in our newscasters. They'll look at some creep on the news, and they'll say, this guy's not even human. Well, bingo. I think they just hit it. Right. Yeah. And I think we're dealing with that. You taught us that only one had a clean DNA. Yeah. And that was Noah, not his wife. She yeah. carried the... Right. Well, that's another issue. That's another. And yeah. I taught that in Genesis. <coughs> yeah. Right. Because when you get into the Hebrew, when it says that Noah was perfect and a righteous man, it was Tamim. It, it wasn't Sadiq. He wasn't righteous in his actions. He was righteous in his body. Hmm. That yeah. it's the same as the sacrificial lamb without spot or, or, or blemish. Yeah. But yeah. not his wife. His no. wife, no, only Noah was pure that way. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that that could explain some things too. And then you get into your whole study on Ham becomes and Cush becomes a whole another. They could have descended from Noah's wife. Yeah, I don't want to get too far gone yeah. here, but yeah. But okay, I let's, just think that that's yeah. one reason we could have had the large grace. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Gary. We're kind of touching on what Pastor Bruce said, going along with the mitochondrial DNA from the woman and how genetics and recessive genes work, that it could have been passed down that way. But the point I wanted to make, I have a video, oh, it's around 1920 in Japan, of a giant walking down the street in a parade. He was about 12, 15 feet tall. Yeah. You have all the Native American stories yeah. of the red-headed giants with six fingers, six toes, mm -hmm. and double rows of teeth that were cannibalistic. Uh, Buffalo Bill yeah. Cody mentioned it in yeah. his, his book. Diary. Catalina's got a lot of stuff there. But there's also a story about the Kandahar giant in Afghanistan yeah. Yeah. that the military came upon during you know the wars over there, you know that came out of that cave and he was redheaded giant, double rows of teeth, six fingers and six toes. And the old custom of Native Americans yeah. raising how? up their how was it had a point. It was to count their fingers. Yeah. Yeah. That's the reason for that. You know, so there's many, many instances, and the military jumped on that real quick over the Kandahar giant after they killed it. Yeah. They swooped in and it disappeared yeah. real fast. Wow. Yeah. You know, so they, you know, with all the genetics and all the crazy stuff going on behind the scenes, God knows what they did with that. Right, right. They said he was a Trump supporter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's never red hat, he had red hair. <laughs> you know, that's the next movie that Harrison Ford is going to go looking for. Well, we can introduce the Kandahar giant to Camilla. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I told you about the wheat, the barley, the grapes, the next was figs. You know, I love figs. I don't know about you. Um, I remember back when I was about 15 or 16. I was, in Peg I was in Peggy's backyard, and they had a fig tree. And I walked up to the tree, and I pulled a fig off. I just cleaned it there with the water hose. I started eating it. And I remember her dad saying, now that's the way you eat figs. Because she stood there like, ugh, you know. <laughs> I loved it. And, you know, and, and I think maybe that's why her dad really <laughs> loved me, you know. So go ahead, uh, Kathy. Kathy, you have a explain 
the fig. The fig. <laughs> oh, I love figs. Yeah. Okay, you guys. So you know, fig tree in in Israel are everywhere. Okay, and they always have the big trunks. You know, so uh, and then maybe that's why uh, you know it's mentioned. Even Yeshua mentions the fig tree in the Gospel of Mark and Matthew. Okay, pomegranates are next, and it can be said that it represents the Torah. Okay, I have never counted the seeds in the in the pomegranate. Uh, have you? Okay, but it is said there are 613 seeds. No? Okay. All right, that's another one. That was another thing I was going to hand over to Maria to do. So. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, but they say there's 613 <laughs> seeds in every pomegranate. All right. Just the ones from Israel. Just the ones from Israel? So, so what are you saying? A Christian pomegranate only has nine? Because they don't they don't observe the Sabbath? Okay. Oh, they're all over the place? Okay. Okay, and then you come to olives. You may think that the Italians own uh, the, the corner on all the olive oil, but it's Israel that is famous for their olive oil. I really love the little jar you guys brought me. We still have our olive oil. So... Uh, it was from olive that the oil for the lampstand was made. In ancient times, this was an eight-day process in, uh, to produce one vial of oil. Uh, we saw many hills in Israel with rows, rows of uh, olive trees. Uh, and then we get to dates. Many times we read honey instead of dates. When it says honey, the writer is not referring to the honey from the bees, but he's referring to the sweet honey syrup from the dates, okay? Uh, if all these items were in the manna that fell from heaven, I would have been the first one outside to pick it up. So I that was just my thought on uh, all these items uh, there in Israel. So when you... Uh, when you, uh, and, oh, in letter C, then there, there are your seven species. Wheat, barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, uh, olives, and dates. Now we're going to get to near the end of this uh, portion. Okay, we have eaten... Now we have eaten all this. Now what do we do? It says in 8.10, When you have eaten and, and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which, we, which he has given you. We are to thank the Lord for the good land, okay, that he has provided. So, you know, and we do. We thank the Lord for the awesome land that we live in. Uh, we may have some jerks in Washington, but we do live in a good land. And sack, oh, absolutely. And, the Olympic team. <laughs> and on the Olympic team, you're right. It's funny you should mention that, Bill. We were talking about that earlier. I just can't get into the Olympics. Did that start yeah. yesterday? I don't know. Yeah. I won't yeah. watch any of that stuff anymore. Yeah, I just, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. they're not going to stand. They want to protest and all this. And oh, my gosh. I mean, I don't want. We are one of the nations. We are one of the nations, yeah. I don't even know if it started, and I hear it has. It doesn't matter, you know. Okay, in verse 9, Moses warned the Israelites not to take credit for all the good that God has given them. It was not because of their righteousness, you know. In fact, he even says it, you know, the good land that I promise your forefathers, okay. So, so uh, they are, you know, they are a stubborn people. It was because of God's love for them and the promise he gave Abraham. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, uh, as well as uh, in uh, Deuteronomy 6, we, we get to the Shema again. Okay, uh, The Shema should be recited every day when you rise up in the morning and before you go to sleep at night. And, and then in chapter 11... We're reading about Teflon again. 
Okay, uh, in Exodus 13.9 and 13.16, the Lord is speaking to Moses, and God is not giving suggestions. Uh, uh, he's giving a commandment. Okay, again, in Deuteronomy 6 and in Deuteronomy uh, 11, he's telling the people to do the following. Okay, so in 11.18, it says, You shall therefore take these words of mine to heart and soul, and to soul. You shall tie them as a sign on your hand, and they, they shall be frontlets on your forehead. Now, teflon or phylacteries, uh, if you're, you know, uh, you've got one Hebrew and one in, in Greek, uh, they are small leather boxes. If you're not familiar with them, and you have one that you tie on your upper arm, okay, and the other one that you put on your forehead. Anyone here ever wore phylactery or teflon? Okay. Okay, I guess maybe I'll, I'm probably the only one. Okay, um, there is really no argument. Oh, okay. Uh, who is it? Who has something to say? Did they leave something in the chat room? Kent, who was saying? I think he said. Oh, Kent. Uh, Kent has two. Yeah, uh, yeah Kent. Uh, yep. Okay, so so Kent has. Okay, there is really no argument if Zitzit was worn in the time of Yeshua, or if, even if Yeshua wore it. But there are some who think teflin, te, tefillin is something only the Jews do. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 23.5. If you don't have your Bible, mark it down, 23.5. In fact, I'm going to read it right now. It says, And they do all their deeds to be noticed by other people. Yeshua is talking about the Pharisees, okay? For they broaden their phylacteries and they lengthen their tassels of their garments, okay? Yeshua is rebuking the Pharisees for the extra long seat seat and the larger than normal to fill in that they were wearing. Uh, you know, they're, they were doing this all for show. It was kind of like, look at me I, and look how righteous I am. You know, now I ask, but then this is what I'm going to ask you. Why didn't the Pharisees tell Yeshua, you don't even wear tefillin, so why are you questioning ours? He didn't say that. Maybe they didn't say that because Yeshua did wear tefillin. If he was, and if he was Jewish, which he is, he then, just like he wore tzitzit, he would have wore tefill, tefillin, as it's commanded in Exodus and Deuteronomy. So, uh, you know, they at that time, uh, 2,000 years ago, or even before that, they said that the tefillin that they used to wear, today it's probably about like a two inches by two inches, something like that. Uh, but back then they said it was more, it was much smaller than that. Like a post stamp. Maybe. It, would, it would have been maybe something like that. I was gonna say like about a half inch by half inch all the way around. But it was much smaller. Uh, but then that tells you why the Pharisees, you know, they started making them big box. It's just like those hats. Have you ever seen the? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was yeah, called, you know, you know. Oh my gosh! When we were in Israel, we saw many of those. But uh, it's you know, you they're could. Not even Jewish. They're Russian. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. You know, but but it's just like getting bigger. I guess bigger yeah. meant more uh, spectacular. You know, and that's what the Pharisees were doing. Size they were matters. what? <laughs> Size matters. Size matters. <laughs> they all have no doubt. Uh -oh. <laughs> so uh, wait, wait. Let me, and then I'll get right to. I got to see where I'm at. Okay, I'm done. Yeah, go ahead watching a series on uh, Orthodox Jews and um, when they went into their prayer they wrapped, it looked like a um, black leather stripe, mm -hmm. a strip. Yeah, that's what that's they are. This is. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what, what this is. is. Yeah. yeah. Someone on the arm. Yeah. On the yeah. Line and yeah. 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 Pastor Paul. Yeah, that's become the tradition as to how they do it. Tradi yeah. You always say tradition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a commandment. It's a commandment to do it. Right. But how it's done is a tradition. Just like the Zizi, no. there is no commandment as to how to tie it. 
or any of that. It just says to wear a fringe in the four corners of your garment. And blue, right. just a blue cord. Attached what? Just a blue cord. Yeah. So, you know, the tradition of how to do it has been manifest. Now, you know, if, if we are serious about that, then the real question is, why are not all of us wearing these things? Yeah. See, because honestly, if it is a commandment, and we say it's a commandment, we agree it's a commandment, but we don't do it, well then, it means nothing. Yeah. Well, know, except yeah. we're out of order. <laughs> well, it's just like the blue cord. You know, I have a blue cord on mine, you know, but the blue cord isn't hanging all the way down. It's just right around the top of my seat seat. Well, you we know? Pick and, we pick and choose, because most people are wearing Most shirt, people right? do. Made of cotton and wool or cotton and You're right. To, yeah. It's still a commandment, why don't we do it? Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, but, uh, but you know, but here he covers, here he's covering it again. The phylactery or the tefillin or teflin, uh, whatever you want to call it. You know, he's, it, it's being covered again. <clears throat> and all of these are reminders to for God's people. Um, you know, he also talks about the mezuzah, the mezuzah, or to mark on the doorpost or the or your door frame. You know, it's reminders to let you know. You know, when you're leaving the house, when you're walking in, you know, uh, that we have it right here in when you walk inside uh, the doorway. Uh, so. Uh, 3,000 years ago, God's people needed reminders. There are no, it's no different than today. We need reminders uh, to, to let us know who we serve. Okay, uh, letter D. Uh, bless the Lord after the meal for the good land he has given you. So we don't even break record. You know, uh, this is, and I, I thought it, you know, Bill, you know, Bill, I thought it was uh, wonderful. I didn't bring it in here with me, but the Didache, uh, which is a, a document from the early uh, church fathers or early, I should say, phenomenal. the apostles. Yeah. I should say fathers. I, I, I would say the, the apostles themselves. You know, um, they say that traditionally, you know, there's a prayer that the Jews have been praying for thousands of years after they eat a meal. And there's four uh, items in there that they always mention. Well, it, wouldn't you know it, in the Didache, they have a prayer there that is almost identical to what they were praying, and that's from, from the, the apostles firsthand. There's people that believe it was second century, but I believe it, it is from the apostles. Yeah. You know, but, uh, but let's move on. The next parasha is uh, Re'e, which can mean behold or see. Okay, Roman numeral two, re'e, means see or behold in Hebrew. In Deuteronomy 11.26, we can read the opening verse as, Behold, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. Or you can even say it, see. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. But, you know, either way will do. Moses is warning the people about making the wrong choice. He warns them that if idolatry of, of making sacrifices outside or away from God's temple, uh, and then he also says that he will choose where the temple will be. God will make that choice, not man. We're also warned against false prophets. There is a lot here pertaining to making the right choice. Uh, you know, if you want blessing or if you want curse, then the whole thing is you make the right choice. Yeah, you choose, exactly. You might think that the biggest problem for the Israelites when they entered the promised land were the armies that they were about to battle with. But no, there was a bigger problem, and it was idols. Okay, idol worship is an abomination to the Lord, that is why the Israelites were told to totally destroy all the altars, okay, the buildings. And you know when they said, when he said destroy them, don't leave anything standing. And then the other thing was, after you've done all that, you are not to rebuild on that site. It is supposed to be desolate, 
destroyed, don't ever do it again. Unlike the Romans, the Muslims, and even the Christians who built right on top of pagan temples. Okay, go ahead, uh, Bruce. You know, it's interesting to note that uh, if you do a careful study, you quickly find out that the reason Israel was disciplined, taken into uh, captivity, so on and so forth, was not for what I would call daily human sins. Mm -hmm. It was always for idolatry. Yeah. Yeah. Always for idolatry. It was never for uh, getting drunk or sleeping around or uh, not that we're condoning those things, but that wasn't the issue. The yeah. issue was idolatry and idolatry is defined as anything that comes above God in our life. Right. So that is really, I think, where our focus should be today. What is above God in my life? Right. Not these daily little sins that I am struggling with or whatever, but what do I place above God in importance in my life? Because that's what you end up getting judged over. Yeah. You know, I was reading a. Uh, what did you say then? Used up. Uh, use, use the mic. We'll pass it back and forth. I'll take the caller off. That, would you say then that when Israel wanted a king that they went over God? That oh, yeah. in a way it yeah. was asking for idolatry? It was, idolatry. it was definitely idolatry because what the people wanted, they wanted the same thing that the nations yeah. had. And you know, and they, they are a theocracy. Yeah. And they wanted a king yeah. over over the theocracy. So all the yeah. way through they they were in idolatry. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. if we will examine our own lives in that light. Get the mic. Get the mic. Can we kind of hurry this up a little yeah, bit? <laughs> no, we're doing good now, you guys. We got <laughs> if, if we will examine our lives, because listen, anything can come about God. Family. Family. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, job. Mary. Children. Yeah. Children. Grandchildren. These are all inherently good things. Grandchildren. And even grandchildren can. And in fact, we were talking about this the other day. Grandchildren is a huge issue in our generation. Yeah. It's seemingly more, you know, when I was growing up, my grand there was no special relationship between the grandparents and me. And now grandchildren have become like gods in many in many instances. And I understand that. I mean, I've got more pictures of my grandchildren than I do my kids. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> for, I would have just skipped right to the grandchildren if I'd known about children. But, <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? So I think we have to examine these things because these, these things are not bad things. They are good God-given things. It's when we place them in priority over God that they become evil. Right. Idolatry. He's a jealous God. Yes. And what's he jealous about? Anything that supersedes his him. And, and we get focused in on, you know, the gay movement, the homosexuals, the drug use. Those are all out of hell, there's no doubt. But that's not what is, is the big issue with God. It's idolatry. So the throne of David really was more of like an idol. Well, it, it, they weren't supposed to have a king. They weren't. No. Okay. no. I'm done. Yes, I'm done. <laughs> Except for that. I think I'm done. If, if Maria will let me go, I'm done. <laughs> Sharon, Sharon, give it to anybody except Bill. <laughs> a parent. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess it is our biggest problem. It's just hard to recognize it today. But going back to Hezekiah in 2 Kings uh -huh. 18, um, I'm going to just read the middle part. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. 
and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent was still there being worshipped that Moses had made for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it it was called Meshetan Meshetan that's almost like Satan no. it's the root for Meshetan it's the root for the serpent for the serpent yeah he trusted in the Lord the oh going back to the garden yeah okay he trusted in the Lord the God of Israel so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him nor among those who were before him. He often gets second fiddle, but sound in scripture is yeah. putting him pretty high up here. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but he kept his commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him wherever he went out. Yeah. Whenever he went out, he prospered. Hand it, hand it to your wife. Um, well, it's interesting because, Pastor, you said, you know, homosexuals and it's gone far beyond homosexual. They are trying, they are gnashing their teeth at the God of creation. Yeah. Because yeah. everything he said, um, male and female, he created them. Right. Okay, now how many uh, genders do you think some people think there are? Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think um, far more than that. Um, you know, bestiality is coming in. I, they are gnashing their teeth at what God has said. And it reminds me so much of Revelation and all of these movements um, that are coming into our country, so anti-God. And, and that's where those movements have put themselves before right. God. Of course, they don't even recognize the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but that's what, why are they so against him if they don't even, uh, there's something within them that knows that he's real. Um, and they are trying to wipe everything that he ever said in the creation and elsewhere within the word out right. of our yeah. society. Yeah. So let, let me, let me, yeah. let me, let me, let me get your answer that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. The, the you know it, yeah I wasn't condoning any of that obviously and you know the person struggling with homosexuality is one issue we've had practicing homosexuals in this congregation yeah. and that's just another sin yeah. the movement yeah. is from the is the out agenda. of a pit the agenda yeah. is a much it, it's a spirit yes. uh, so I think for us. You know, most of the people in the congregation don't deal with those types of issues, yeah. so that's what I was addressing. What What is it that plagues us? It's interesting you said how many, how many uh, genders. genders? They're yeah. saying seventy-two, which is very interesting that because <laughs> yeah, seventy-two. The Sanhedrin. But, but what's so interesting about that? The Jews, the Jews tell us there's seven. That God has seventy-two names. Yeah. And now you just tie that together and you start to come. Long. Yes. One name is 72. One name is 72 right. letters long right. also. Right. So so now you can start putting that together and you can start to see Satan combats everything that's everything. God. Everything. Right. Everything. everything. And the nations right. are buying into it hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. And it's, it's remember last January when the, when the pandemic things broke out, I said a new spirit has been unleashed on planet Earth that we have never seen before. That was a prophetic statement. And that was the spirit of anti-Messiah like we've never seen it released before. Right. And we still haven't figured out how to combat it yet, in my opinion. It's what? Won't be able to buy and sell without a vaccine. Yeah, I know. It, it's, it's happening very quickly now. And it's, it's the... It's, Good and evil. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, Pastor Paul. Okay. All right. Now, just because we're talking about what Israel was told to do when they went into Canaan is to destroy all of the idols and all of the right. things that are there. Now, if we stop and think, you and I grew up in a country that had a Christian culture. In other words, everybody at one point pretty much went to church. We believed there was a God and all of that. You know, in the, in the 50s and 60s, early 60s, it was pretty much that kind of a country. That Christian culture is now dead. 
it is no longer the culture of this country. Right. And if you stop and think, those that are in the position of control are taking over, what do they do? They destroy all the statues, they destroy all of the remnants of anything that has any intrinsic value that people would look at and say, there is something that reminds me of, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, ISIS did that in the ancient world, tearing yeah. down everything they could and destroying the past. Because when you destroy the history, yeah. the history is soon forgotten. And history's been rewritten many times, actually. So in our country right now, we're in this phase where the other side of things is raising its head and it's finally revealing itself as to what this country is based on and the direction that it's going. You know, if you take a look, and I say it again, I mentioned it yesterday, find out about Bohemian Grove. Find out what it represents. Find out what the whole United States, when Where you look at the dollar go? bill, why does it have all the symbols on it? And if you look at our rotundra in the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., 72 stars around in the dome in the top. Right. Every god that has been is depicted there except Yeshua. I mean, every ancient god, the snake god from South America, the feathered snake, everything is depicted in the rotundra of a Capitol building but not Yeshua, not Jesus Christ in any way. And people go, well, we're a Christian country. The most difficult thing to, for us to realize is when we've been deceived, it's very hard to break, wake people up to the reality of what really took place. Right. Because we were all raised and taught this is a Christian country. From kids, we believed it was a Christian. We used to pray in school. We used to do all of this kind of stuff. Uh, but now we have switched over and the Bohemian, 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 Bohemian Grove uh, where all the presidents, all the males of society, actors, uh, CEOs of all the major companies, foreign people come to Bohemian Grove and they actually sacrifice an effigy to a statue that they bring from, uh, uh, what is it, uh, from San Francisco that they take up there. And they have a statue of a huge owl that they actually sacrifice an effigy in front of. And you can see pictures of the presidents being there. It's not like, oh, this is just a story. No, you can see Reagan, you can see uh, Nixon, the Bush. you can see both of the Bushes, all of these people right there participating in it, and it's all about, it's all about That's setting why they up, want them out of there. You know, it's all about setting up this country to return to that new world order that when it, people first came to this country, that's why they came, to establish a new world order. And we thought it's going to be religious freedom for Christians. Yeah. It's religious freedom, all right. But for the God that they were having conflicts with in Europe, yeah. and Europe drove them out, they came here and established it. Yeah. Well, we do have more. Let Janie go first. Well, all of the conversations that I hear in Torah study uh, I have to somehow sift that through my wee little head and then I apply it to a place called that I call Janie Land. <laughs> because in my world, all of these things that I hear in Torah study or in the sermons or when I you know, <coughs> join a prayer meeting on Tuesday nights, whatever, all of these puzzle pieces are really falling into place for me. And there are times when I feel like the burden is just too heavy for a person of my stature and whatever. Just recently, I've been through a lot of CAT scans. Um, 
uh, EKGs, all sorts of things that have to do with the radiology department in three different places, different places here in the Inland Empire. And when I went in to Mountains Community Hospital, this is just right down the road from us, to get one of my first chest x-rays, I think it was, for this up and coming surgery, I had to first fill out a paper that was signed and sealed by Governor uh, Gavin Newsom and had the California state seal on it. And it was all about gender. And there were three different categories. And I could be f male, I could pick female, I could pick unknown, I could pick don't understand the question. I could pick um, I could pick all sorts of things and then I got to one that which gender are you the most loving to what? and I thought which gender am I most loving to I mean but that was a category of, of status that I could be in so now that you're telling me these 72 different options that I have in this world and I'm telling you, the little gal that was having me sign all this thing just to get a chest x-ray, she was very serious about all of this. And she also, uh, on the paperwork, said, you, you have to read all of this and sign it that you have been advised of all of this nonsense, absolute garbage, that is all over this just to get a chest x-ray. And so I had to sign it, but it also said that I should receive copies of this and that this information was posted on the uh, door entering the emergency room and exiting the emergency room. So I thought, well, let's just push all the buttons and see what happens. So I pushed the button of, you know, I really do need copies of this. And this girl just nearly fell back out of her little chair. <laughs> it was like, you really want copies of it? I said, well, see, it says this right here. She grabbed the paper out of my hand. She started reading. She says, oh my, oh, oh. And then she says, well, I don't know. She said, wait a minute, I'll go ask Travis. So Travis was the authority somehow in that whole emergency room. And she said, I'm sorry, I can just give you copies of what you've signed. So I'm saying all of this to say what kind of conversations Benjamin, who is six years old, and Hannah, who is eight years old, we have extraordinarily deep conversations that I didn't even know how to have when I was a freshman in college. <laughs> And we are having to do these conversations now with our children because we have to warn them yeah. according to what's really happening in the world. And they come up with the questions and then I go to whatever God says about it. Amen. But we are living in such perverted times and such craziness that if you don't get on board with this, you will start seeing this nonsense pop up with all your children and your grandchildren. Yeah, and then they'll start knocking at your door. I just want to, I just want to jump in and say because when I went to the hospital, they asked me the same questions, and I told them I was like, you know, me, I was like, are you kidding me? You really need to know this. Do I really need to tell you who, what I prefer? You know, I, I kind of just, you know, started laying into them, and 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 they said. No, no. It's because the, the reason it's, you know, because I wanted to know why they're asking me these questions. Does, does it really matter? And, they're, and they said it was because they want to know what the effect, you know, it's all because of the virus. Yeah. And they want to know what, like, the, if, if you're a lesbian or if you're a transgender, what the effect, if it's any different on the different, you know, oh my gosh. You know, yeah. that's why they're doing that. Asking those questions is because they're trying to establish whether, you know, if it's the virus is different with lesbians than it is with, you know, this gender. If if you're you're yeah, straight, yeah. you know, if it's different with people that are bisexual rather than straight, you know, they just that's why they're doing it. Yeah. Okay, one more. Go ahead. That may be what's on the surface, but you, we really need to understand what spiritual warfare really is, is, and very, very few people have
have no concept of what spiritual warfare warfare is, let alone train and prepare to fight it. You know, we tend to stick our head in the sand and what they call the ostrich effect, and just it's going to blow over. You know, but the last time to prepare for war is after it's already begun. Yeah. And what is happening now is like what some of the stuff that Paul was saying, the enemy isn't even worried about hiding it anymore. They are on a full march. You know, there's no more deceptions, there's no more trickery, there's no more hiding in the shadows. They're not even trying to hide it. They are on the march and we are retreating because we simply have no concept of what spiritual warfare is. We have no, well, anyways. <laughs> Were you gonna say something, Ray? Yeah, I was gonna say, say two things. One, I think Pastor Bruce was right earlier, you know, homosexuality, transgender, that's all a sin. The problem is they want us to believe it's no longer a sin, and that's where I personally get upset at. Right. I'm sure you know us yeah. too, working for uh, the county of San Bernardino. Yeah. You know, we get things all the time saying that this person has got the operation. They now want to be referred to as Brenda. Yes, exactly. Or her, yeah. or them, or it. You <clears throat> see, you getting upset, that's the distraction. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay? We all get upset about shocking things like that. That's the distraction. He's good at distraction. He's good at illusion. That's yeah. what he does. He, you know, he's doing this over here. He distracts you over here. He's really gone over here. We all get upset about the things he wants us to be upset about. It is much deeper than that. As oh, yeah. Really yeah. Going yeah. On. Yep. And, and the other thing we're not dealing with. And the, the second thing, thing is, I think it should be a challenge for us to come up with a 73rd gender. <laughs> One new man. <laughs> One new man. We need to come up with number 73. Yeah. yeah. I'm not buying the Sports Illustrated swimsuit with this number again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not that I ever bought it. <laughs> <laughs> See, that microphone up like that. Did you notice that? <laughs> Did you hear that? He said, not that I ever bought it. Are <laughs> <laughs> well, you selling your back copies? <laughs> <laughs> yes, go ahead, Sharon. Well, you know, evil has been in the world since the garden yeah. Um, yeah. and everything God has put in place will take place yes um, everything he said is going to happen will indeed happen um, but it seems to me that we're giving the enemy glory that he does not deserve right uh, and power that he does not deserve I mean I've known about the Bohemian Grove for years years and years um, would I ever participate? I would never be invited, but I'd never participate. It costs a million dollars a year to be part. But we've met some people. <laughs> when who? That that lady vice president. Oh, Kamala Harris. All right, but you know, I think we God is showing us the times that we are in. Um, and it's just like when Israel had to fight. Um, and David had to fight Goliath. Okay, Goliath was huge. Yeah. David was not all that right. large. And I think people are getting upset. They're getting afraid. They're getting scared. And I think we should not concentrate on what the enemy's doing. We should concentrate on what God is doing. Amen. 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 No, that's good. That's good. Okay, well... Well, you hand, hand the mic over to Pastor Bruce. Let me give you two more. In letter A, <clears throat> in letter A, blessing if you obey the commandments and curses if you don't obey. Blessings and curses are the fill-ins. And then in letter B, destroy all the idols in the land. Okay, Pastor Bruce. I was just going to say that, you know, this is a spiritual battle, but a spiritual battle does not mean you just stay at home and pray. Uh, David had to physically go out in the flesh and fight Goliath. He prayed first. He said, I'm not going to rely on your armor, Saul. Yeah. 
going to rely on the God of Israel, uh, but I'm going to I'm going to go and I'm actually going to do uh, a natural encounter here. I think for for you and I, one of the things I I'm not going to say the Lord has put this on my heart just yet, but I've been toying with it now for several months. Uh, I've already met with a lawyer because I'm going to start suing for everything. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. I'm already irate that they're already taking, you know, if you've been molested by clergy, I'm going to sue. Yeah. And I'm going to sue for everything <clears throat> I can get. When they ask you about your gender, you need to sign one page and say, you know what? I'm identifying as a black female today. <laughs> then when you sign the second paper, no, I'm Hispanic male. <laughs> Tomorrow, this is what I'll do. I'm no. be a fox. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. Create a, a paperwork war. nightmare. Because that's what we can do in the natural right now. Jam the system. Jam the system. <laughs> they want to know what gender you are? List all 72. But do it on 72 different pieces of paper and sign them all. Get copies of every single one of them. Why not? You see what I'm saying? I think we need to do that. I think we need to start going to court. I said for 20 years, I said that the spiritual battle is going to end up in the court system. I've been saying that for 20 years, and, and this is where we're at today. We need to start bringing this to where they're going to feel it. Right, right. You know, and they feel it in their pocketbooks. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and I'm serious. We need to get serious about this. Yeah. And yes, you pray, you do spiritual battle, but you also kick them between the legs. Yeah. Because yep. that's where it's going to really hurt. And and I think the whole church has to rise up and start doing that. Yep. The whole church has to rise up and say, you know what? You can take your mask and shove it. I'm not wearing it. Ever. Yeah. You and you can throw all of us in jail. Right. Why are we so afraid of going to jail? Yeah. I've been in jail many times. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> you, know, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> we... We really need to start rising up as a voice in the wilderness. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna, ha yeah, we're gonna have to move on. This is the last comment. No, I have to. I've got to hit the road. Yeah, I, I just got, I just, I just got a, a buzz right now. Are you almost done? We've got a pastor here that can take over. Go ahead. It says that we are to be as wise as serpents, yet gentle as doves. Yeah. And I'm gonna have to disagree with Sharon on this one. Okay. In the art of warfare, spiritual war, we need to understand you always got to know your enemy, sometimes better than your friend. You got to know your enemy. You got to know his strategies. You got to know his tactics. You have to know the enemy very, very well. Be as wise as a serpent. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's good to understand and everything God's way, but. You don't go into battle without knowing your adversary. David was very, very well familiar with Goliath, who he was. He did his background information. He did his intelligence. He did his recons. He training tra and that's just the basics
Pastor Vince, excuse me. Pastor Vince, we don't have any sound. Sorry, Shane. Hey, you cut you off. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. We had a, something happen here, a surge, but... Uh, Peggy cut you off. <laughs> that's Peggy telling me, come on, get, get going. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are many so-called Pentecostal prophets who declare that Jesus did away with Torah, and it's perfectly all right to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. How many times have you had conversations with people, and they belong to a Pentecostal church, and they say, we don't do anything that the Catholics do. Yeah. Well, yeah. what day are you meeting on? You know, because it was a Roman church that changed it. You know, so, uh, you know, and then today there are millionaires with huge followings and, and, and they're laughing their way all the way to the bank yeah. because of, you know, of changing things up and giving different messages. Uh, but Deuteronomy gives us a little insight. Uh, the first thing it says to look at is that the prophet must not speak against keeping the commandments of Torah. And then it also says the prophet must not speak in the names of other gods is what Torah says. And number three, predictions made by the prophet must be fulfilled. So if all these three, these three things there, you can find out if you have a false prophet or not. You know, chapter 11 of the Didache says to give hospitality to the prophet, 
But if he stays more than two days, yeah. he is not a prophet. Yeah. I, I, I don't think I've ever heard yeah, that. Yeah, it's dedicate, yeah. T- dedicate chapter 11. The dedicate is a really... It's a good... Re- yeah. A piece of work. Okay. Yeah. You need to get a copy yeah. and read it right. and study it. Because it, I, be- I personally believe it's from, it's good. from the apostles. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and then it also says... In chapter 11 of the Didache, you are to feed the prophet. But if he asks for money, he is a false prophet. Okay. It also says that if the prophet says to do something of the Lord, but he himself doesn't hold to that practice, he is a false prophet. D-I-D-A-C-H-E. <laughs> there are many. In fact, we we that's what D I D A C H E. Didache. Okay, the Didache also says that if the person is a true prophet and he lives among the people, so if he's a prophet that lives and has his home here, uh, he, he and he's part of the community that you should support him. He's just like a teacher. The true sign of a, of a false prophet is one who teaches against Torah. And that's what the Didache say, says. Go ahead, Pastor yeah, Bruce. Just, uh, one thing with the Didache that's so interesting, it, it, it addresses the dilemma that we have today, Yes. which is how do the Gentile believers fit in with the Torah? Uh, because that was the dilemma they had. And it's the same dilemma. What applies to the Jew? What applies to the Gentile? What applies to the land? What applies to those outside the land? All legitimate questions. And it's, it's interesting because what they say, what you just read, events was um, don't add or subtract from the Torah. But I believe it's in chapter 1 of the Didache. It says... Uh, if you can keep all of the Torah, you're a righteous man, but if you can't keep it all, keep as much, much as, as you, you can. can. Now that that helps us to understand why we wear seed seed and not to fill it. Right. Do what you can do. What you can do. Right. And this alleviates a lot of frustration in the church and condemnation. Because there is no condemnation for those in the Lord. So as soon as you, if you end up on a works trip, then you think you have to do every single thing. And the, the problem with that is, I don't think that that's exactly right. Right. You can't do every single thing. And we've talked about that 100,000 times. You're not even supposed to do every single thing. We know there's divisions in the Torah. Yes. So we do what we can do. And then what we, like what Pastor Paul was saying, we want to be progressively moving forward in our understanding of Torah and applying more and more every day so that we can be stronger. Uh, But you've got to fight the fight that's in front of you today, whether you're doing 100% or not. Right. You see what I'm saying? And you look at people like King David who advanced the kingdom larger than any other kingdom. I mean, he wasn't exactly uh, an outstanding, uh, upright saint. I mean, he had some problems. He had issues. And, but, but look what happened. He, he applied as much as he could for where he was. But don't be satisfied where you're at. Always be wanting to push further into the things of God. Amen. And that that alleviates so much misunderstanding for us, and and ultimately frustration. Yeah. I think. But aren't you giving me a, a way out? But I know it, we can't do. It God anymore. always gives us a way out. Uh, yeah, but. And say I thank you, Lord. Yeah. I can't go any further, so I'm not going to try. Well, it. You can you can take that attitude, but that's, that's an attitude of the heart, right there. Yeah, that's, an a, that, that's a bad attitude right. of the heart. Yeah, I know it's a bad, <laughs> but you know, all things are possible for us. So if that's the attitude, you go. You know what? I'm wearing that today. Okay. You notice who but has the go, microphone? But I can go further. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's calling. 
Yeah. yeah. Okay, you guys, letter D. Letter D. Moses warns to disregard all false prophets. Okay. And then in letter E. Disregard all false false prophets. In letter E, Moses reminds the people that they are all children of God. In this parashah, you'll find out Moses tells them that we are all children of God, a holy people, his own possession. Okay, in chapter 16 now uh, ends this parashah with three major feasts. And there are many festival, festivals, but g again, Moses reminds the Israelites that the men are to appear in person for three major festivals. Even in the millennial reign, the people are, the men are required, at least a representative from every nation is required to, to appear to the place that the Lord chooses, Okay. Uh, this was a time when they they, uh, they would celebrate the Passover. Um, okay, oh, what was, I missed something. The Israelites were commanded to observe the month of Aviv. This was a time when they were, they should celebrate the Passover. And the, and the big feast there is not Passover, but it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yeah. Okay, the Lord also told them to observe the, the Festival of Weeks. This was after the seven weeks of this, of this, from the same time that they put the sickle to the grain. This is the counting of the Omer, okay? <coughs> Shavuot, okay? And this was for them to re remember that they were slaves in Egypt. Uh, they were also told to celebrate the Festival of Tabernacles, which is coming up. Everyone is told to be joyful during this time. They are supposed to celebrate for seven days in the place that the Lord has chosen, and they should be thankful that the Lord has blessed their harvest through the work of their hands. Three times a year, all the men must appear before the Lord. And then uh, he also says, uh, everyone should have a gift in, propor in proportion of how the Lord has blessed them, that nobody should come empty-handed. And that's what we say... Uh, every time when there's a festival, you know, and we don't say it because uh, we want something, we say it because that's what the word says, that you are not to come empty handed. Uh, so in letter E, Moses, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, in letter F, three times a year, every male adult is required to come to the holy temple. Now, the three things that they are required to do, they're commanded to visit. So they're commanded to come. Visit is the fill-in. Then uh, they are commanded to give an offering. And the last thing you're commanded to do is you are commanded to rejoice. <laughs> <laughs> You must be happy. <laughs> you, you know, and even the Feast of Tabernacle, it's a time of rejoicing. Amen. And that it concludes our Torah study. Can I just pray for Pastor Paul?